All right, so welcome to week five in our seven-week fall series. We've been working with this wonderful book here called Finding Yourself in Transition by Robert Brummett. And today we're going to be focusing on the second of our three phases of a transition. We go through an ending, we go through the wilderness, and then we come to a new beginning. So today it's all about the wilderness experience, or as it is sometimes called, the void. We've been through an ending, but the new beginning hasn't quite appeared yet. And we've learned that an ending can at times be a long, drawn-out process, and it actually has several phases of its own. We've also learned that there are times when we may try to resist an ending or refuse to acknowledge that it's upon us, and we know what happens then. All we do is make it last longer. We drag it out even longer. So how do we know that the ending phase is complete and we're into the void phase? Well, according to the author, the big tip-off is the nature and the quality of the emotions that we're experiencing. Endings are characterized by intense emotions. Grief, anger, fear are very common. The void is different. The emotional quality of the void is a sense of emptiness. Things falling flat. It's sometimes described as a, a dryness or an arid quality, the blahs, right, the blues. All sorts of feelings can arise, things like, like abandonment, dread, and even a sense of hopelessness or despair. Those things are common. And I know some of you are starting to think right about now that, boy, this is going to be a bummer this morning, right? You know, ooh, doom, despair, and agony. What was that song we used to sing on Hee Haw? Remember that one? Anyway, I digress. Um, no, it's, it's, it's not going to be a bummer this morning. Actually, it's quite the opposite because we're going to find out that the wilderness of the void is actually a place of healing. It's a place that's filled with opportunity. It's filled with creativity. It's the place where the, the seeds of the new beginning are planted and it's actually empowering. And uh, that's where the void presents a bit of a paradox because... It brings up feelings we'd like to duck and avoid, and yet it offers the very means by which we're going to get through the transition and, in the end, learn who we really are, where we discover the power within. That all unfolds in the wilderness, in the void. So where we left off last week, I was mentioning that um, over the centuries, the great contemplative traditions of the world have focused on the study of human existence. That's what people do in meditation and contemplation. They are studying human existence. And they all agree across the board that part of the human condition is this wilderness experience. And the Buddhists are the ones who actually call it the void or emptiness. St. John of the Cross from the Christian tradition, he called it the dark night of the soul. And in world mythology, from all different cultures, we hear it referred to as the abyss. So we have at our disposal this treasure trove of, of experience and wisdom that's designed to help us to get through these times when we're facing the wilderness. And we're going to explore some of them here this morning to uh, help us to uh, navigate the unknown in the wilderness. Whether we're in a transition because of a change and ending in the external world, or whether we're experiencing transition as a, as a phase of spiritual growth, because that's what it's all about. Spiritual growth involves change. The same phases can happen when we're going through a major shift in our spiritual outlook. We all have in common the fact that we go through these void and wilderness experiences and nobody's alone. You may think sometimes that, oh, this is just unique and it's happening to me. It happens to everyone. So from the Buddhist tradition, we have the work of uh, one of my favorite uh, meditation teachers, Jack Kornfield. He wrote a book called A Path with Heart, A Guide Through the Perils and Promises of Spiritual Life. The Perils 
and promises. We like the promises, don't we? We're not so crazy about the perils. Those of us who dare to engage in a transformative spiritual path will, guaranteed, eventually come face to face with some of the perils on the way, and we find them in the void. Spiritual life involves ongoing change and transformation and transition, and Buddhism in particular emphasizes the fact that everything, everything about life is impermanent, including our sense of self. Losing our sense of self, that can be one of the most unsettling and unpleasant aspects of transition. I'm not saying that that happens with every single change or transition, but it's very common. It's because we all have these, these roles that we play in the world, and when our role in the world or, or, or our status comes to an end, our self-image can take a hit. It can fall apart. I had to let go of the, of the role or image or status, whatever you want to call it, that was called trial lawyer. I had to do that if I wanted to go to ministerial school, and uh, I played that role for 20 years, 20 plus years actually, and I think it was a couple weeks ago I mentioned that probably the best thing I did before moving to Kansas City with Karen was um, to take a year off before starting school at Unity Institute. And it was a year in the void. It was a year in the wilderness, and it was accompanied by something that I can really only describe as a, a, it was a sense of weirdness. It was like being in the twilight zone. I didn't have a profession to define me, and it was very tempting to um, try to find something, anything really, just to provide a sense of identity, and we all know what happens when we do that. It's called uh, uh, same dance, different partner, right? I mean, you know, we really don't end up changing anything. We end up just kind of retreading the same territory. And uh, for the first time I could remember, I had no answer to uh, that question that people seem to be asking all the time. You know the question I'm talking about, right? So what do you do? So what do you do? Now, how the heck was I supposed to answer that? Oh, you know, the usual. I breathe, eat, sleep, drive around, the occasional panic attack, you know, that kind of thing, right? Isn't it completely unacceptable to just say nothing? <laughs> totally unacceptable in our that the truth, it was the truth. I mean, I could get into the nitty-gritty of what I do in my but you know. Basically, nothing in terms of what that question really is trying to get at. But what else was there other than an explanation? So I was between gigs, basically, waiting for new stuff to come to light. That's about it. In the meantime, nothing but the void, the wilderness, nothing. Well, that's a great opportunity to witness firsthand how the mind, how the ego, constructs the false self, out of the roles that we play, out of our status in our culture. It creates an illusion. Always has been, always will be, but we still insist on believing it's real and treating it as real. And it takes the emptiness of the void to really see this. And here's what Jack Cornfield has to say about it. He says, true emptiness is not empty, but contains all things. The mysterious and pregnant void creates and reflects all possibilities. From it arises our individuality, which can be discovered and developed, although never possessed or fixed. So he packs a lot into those, into those three sentences. He says, from the emptiness arises our individuality, not our personality. That's the crucial distinction here. From the emptiness arises our individuality. Personality, just a name for the false self. Personality is the thing that we build with our roles and likes and dislikes and things like that. Individuality is different. There is an aspect of each of us that is unique and not simply a projection of our likes, our dislikes, our roles, our status in the world. We can call it the true self. 
which is a reflection of pure consciousness, one presence, one power, our individuality. It's the sense, it's the source of our oneness, and yet it's unique because it has to be filtered through our individual experience, our individual and unique perspective and talents. Look at it this way. No one, no one else can inhabit this body or, or inhabit your bodies and, and, and have the unique experiences that we each have. We have our own unique perspectives and talents. They're not fixed and they're never possessed because we're always growing. We're always experiencing something a little bit different every single day. So that's always changing and growing. It can be developed and discovered, but never possessed or fixed. Another way to look at it is that each of us, each of us expresses the one presence and one power in a unique way. And if we think that that somehow makes us special, <laughs> that's the personality speaking. On the other hand, if we think that our uniqueness, our individuality, is our gift to offer the world in service, ah, then we're discovering and developing our individuality. We may think it's the void or the wilderness, but it's also a very powerful, powerful place for developing a deeper and more accurate understanding of who we really are. And isn't that really what the spiritual journey is all about? So any kind of change or transition gives us that opportunity, which is why I kind of like the title of this book that we're working with. It's a little bit of a play on words. Finding yourself in transition. Finding your true self in transition. That's really what, what we're getting at here. Okay, moving on to another tradition. We hear uh, the void referred to as the dark night of the soul. It comes to us from the Christian tradition. It's actually the title of a poem that was written by St. John of the Cross back in 1578. John was going through a profound time of transition. I forget the name of the order he was in. I think he was a Carmelite. And uh, he thought that his Carmelite order was in need of some reformation. There were things going on that were decidedly unspiritual and problematic. And so he was standing up and suggesting changes that needed to be made. And guess what happened to him? His fellow monks grabbed him, threw him in prison, insisted that he be beaten once a week or something out in public. I mean, this is really nasty stuff they did to him. He was rejected and imprisoned by his fellow monks for daring to suggest that his religious order needed some changes. <laughs> Don't you think he was right? I mean, th 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 that bunch doesn't sound very spiritual to me. I mean, they needed some big-time changes. So he, he had it exactly right. He's going through this rejection, and in writing about his experience, he describes the dark night as a, as a long period of unknowing and loss. And uh, he viewed it as a process of death, and rebirth. That's the metaphor we get from John of the Cross. Death and rebirth, which is what's happening on the way to the new beginning. The old self, we see this theme again, the old self had to die in order for the true self to be born. We have to die to the past in order to be reborn. And again, that happens in the void. John of the Cross offers some remarkable advice. I think a very important bit of advice about what we should do when we're in the void. What to do when you're in the wilderness. Here's what he says. The way in which they are to conduct themselves is to devote themselves not at all to reasoning and meditation, since this is not the time for it, but to allow the soul to remain in peace and quietness, although it may seem clear to them that they are doing nothing and are wasting their time. And although it may appear to them that it is because of their weakness that they have no desire in that state to think of anything. <laughs> the language is a little bit awkward. This is being translated from some ancient form of Spanish. And then he concludes by saying, the truth is that they will be doing quite sufficient 
if they have the patience and persevere in prayer without making any effort. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't treat the dark night or the void like it's something we have to fix. Mm -hmm. There's that old mechanistic paradigm at work again. The mechanistic paradigm tells us in the void, having a dark night of the soul, no problem. Just grab the latest and greatest self-help book and pull out that three-step method to learn how to pull yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps. And before you know it, you'll be, you know, what, what, whatever. Our, our culture and the mechanistic paradigm sends the message, don't just sit there, do something. John of the Cross says, don't do anything. Just sit there. It's okay. Great advice. In fact, it's more than, than just okay because it's the best thing to do. When we try to fix it, we're engaging in something that's called spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing. That's when we use spiritual practices to avoid feeling our feelings or to avoid having to face something unpleasant and you know in unity we can be afflicted with a lot of spiritual bypassing find yourself experiencing a negative state of mind oh I'm not depressed and we use denials and affirmations and unskillful ways to 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 duck the process we don't want to do that we don't want to do that now spiritual bypassing that's going to, going to be the the subject of an entire talk but for our purposes today we can look at the void as permission to be a slacker for a while. <laughs> the void is where we can learn to abide and be a human being instead of a human doing. And that's not easy for us because we have this thing called the, the Protestant work ethic that's burned into our subconscious. We, we, we got it from the Puritans. Remember the Puritans that came to this land to escape religious persecution? They were Calvinists. They believed that human beings were basically utterly corrupt and depraved, and they believed that work was a primary value. So they worked from sun up to sundown six days a week, and then when Sunday would come, they'd sit for five hours in church on Sunday. The Puritans basically believed anything good for you must be unpleasant, and anything pleasant must be bad for you. And I like this quote from H. L. Mencken talking about Puritans. He says, Puritanism, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> and I think we can see why they got chased out of England. And they came here, and now we carry on that legacy, and it's something we have to work with. So, in order to best use these timeless spiritual models for change, we may have to undo some serious cultural conditioning. We may have to learn how to say no to certain messages that are programmed into us, messages like it's never, ever okay under any circumstances to simply do nothing. Or that our identity and our value as a, as a human being is defined by what we do, how much money we make, and our status in the social pecking order. In the void, we are asked, I guess I should say in the void, we get to question what we think we know. We get to challenge and sometimes even leave behind the status quo. That's not easy to do, which is why Joseph Campbell, who is one of the world's expert on mythology, calls the path of change and personal growth the hero's journey. He says, we must let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the one that is waiting for us. So this path of change and transformation, because of some of the things it asks us to do and the things we get to do, is the hero's journey. So the message in unity, the message we have for the world, is that everyone has what it takes to be a hero. Everyone can take the journey Everyone can break through to the other side, which is where we'll pick up again next week. See you then. Thank you.